Hey, welcome everyone. I'm Jessica from Greenlight Bookstore, and we are really excited to host tonight's book launch event with our friend and neighbor, Lev Grossman. He's going to be presenting The Silver Arrow, his brand new book for young readers just published today, so you are in for a really excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Lev and to the team at Little Brown for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now, our community of authors and readers is still here, and we're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. So first, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen if you're curious. You are welcome to post your comments and thoughts of all kinds in the chat, as long as you're respectful, of course. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two little speech balloons. So we'll be pulling questions just for Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program tonight. We are recording tonight's event, so look for the recording on our YouTube channel or our podcast later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Silver Arrow, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. And we're excited to be able to offer signed copies because Lev stopped by our bookstores this morning and signed them. So you can order from us online for pickup or shipping anywhere in the US. I'll be pasting the book link again in the chat. And you can mention you'd like a signed copy in the order comments when you check out. Or you can just stop in and shop in the bookstore from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday. And you can purchase Lev's book and many others on site. So if you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying the featured book is a great way to show your support. So, allow me to introduce Lev Grossman. He is the author of five novels, including the number one New York Times bestselling Magicians Trilogy, which has been published in 30 countries. A TV adaptation of the trilogy is going into its fifth season as the top rated show on sci-fi. Grossman is also an award-winning journalist who spent 15 years as the book critic and lead technology writer at Time Magazine, where he published more than 20 cover stories. He's written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Wired, The Believer, The Village Voice, NPR, Salon, Slate, and BuzzFeed, among many others. He's also a beloved Greenlight neighbor who has appeared many times on Greenlight stage as both presenter and interviewer. You can actually hear a great recording of his launch of The Magician's Land on the Greenlight Bookstore podcast. So it's a special treat for us to be able to host him for tonight's launch of a new kind of story for him. He gave us a sneak peek of the Silver Arrow at our virtual reopening party at the beginning of July, which you can find on our YouTube channel. And we've been eagerly looking forward to hearing more about this book ever since. The Silver Arrow is Lev's first book for young readers, and it is a must read. I'm not going to spoil any details that Lev might want to share in his presentation, but I can tell you that it's a book that's perfect for fans of the Chronicles of Narnia and for Roald Dahl, and that the eight and a half year old in my house is already a big fan. It's the kind of book that not only entertains us, but inspires us to see the beautiful, exciting, and precious world around us with new eyes. So to introduce us all to the Silver Arrow, please join me in welcoming Lev Grossman. Thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, and thank you, everybody who came. Um, one of the, uh, um, I like to complain about being a writer. One of the challenging things about being a writer, um, uh, especially is, is the day when your book comes out. Um, because in some ways it is the day that you have been working towards for uh, literally years. Um, and yet there's also this funny feeling when it finally arrives because nothing actually happens. Uh, you, um, you, you wake up in the morning and elsewhere in the world, uh, uh, your book is going on sale uh, in bookstores. Um, but mostly you're sitting at home um, and you're doing your laundry and you're doing your bad quarantine yoga, which is a big project of mine, uh, is to do bad quarantine yoga. Um, and you're thinking, my book's coming out today. Should I, should I be doing something? And I realize what I is that I really wish that I were doing, which is that, and one day when I have as much money as Stephen King, I will arrange this. What I really want is like a giant sized, like ocean liner sized version of my book with, and, and, I, and then I want a, a bottle of really expensive champagne. And then I want to sort of smash it over the spine of the book. And then I'll feel like my book is really published. Um, but until that day comes, uh, I just sit here and try to be present with the moment. And it really is helpful um, to have an event like this and to have you guys come um, and be present with me. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, um, this is my first book for kids. Um, 
hilariously, there is an error in my author bio on the back in the um, back of the Silver Arrow. Um, I've actually written six novels, not five novels. I guess um, it's five novels, not counting the novel that you are holding now, but uh, it's actually six. Um, and sort of thinking back, I've done like almost every kind of writing you could possibly do besides children's writing. Uh, I did write five novels for adults. I wrote a failed dissertation. I wrote really huge gobs of journalism. I wrote two screenplays, one of which is alive and one of which is now dead. Um, but I had never written anything for children. And I, um, you know, I sort of backed into it uh, in that way that you do, which is that I, I have three children and I, 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 I tell them a lot of stories, but usually I would just tell them stories uh, not as a means in itself, but rather as a way to compel them to either fall asleep or stop hitting each other, which they do like, like ama amazingly much. Um, like even more, it's like a, you know, it's like a Three Stooges cartoon all the time. Um, and uh, I, when I sat down to write this, I could not help but feel as if there was something like slightly unseemly about it. Um, where, uh, there's something always, something seedy about it when an author changes um, changes genres or changes media. You sort of, well, you, uh, I feel this, I, you sort of want to like encourage them to get back in their box, um, as the Australians say, pull your neck in. Uh, um, and yet I went ahead and did it anyway. I, I would love to say that the, uh, the story of the Silver Arrow is the story that my children loved the most of any story that I ever told them and that they used to beg to hear it all the time. I probably should be saying that because it would be, um, you know, sort of more, a little bit more on brand. Um, as it happens, it is the second favorite story that I told them. Their very favorite story was a story where they were both animals uh, my son was a hamster and my daughter was uh, a caracal, which is apparently some kind of wildcat that can jump really high. I don't know. Um, anyway, they were a hamster and a caracal and they had superpowers and they were fighting Lex Luthor, who was stealing all the gold and silver from the Gotham Mint. Um, that was just, it was a cracking good story, but I did not think that DC uh, Comics would appreciate me exploiting their intellectual property in that way. So what you get is the Silver Arrow instead. And I'll tell you a little bit more about where it comes from. Uh, uh, Susanna Clark said this, and uh, who wrote Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, and I think it's true for, well, uh, for me as well, which is that uh, novels usually start with a particular image. And in this case, the image was of a girl and she's, she's on a train and the train is empty except for her. And it's sort of rumbling through this darkened landscape. Um, and it's an old fashioned train, it's a steam train, and she's looking out the window of a kind of cozy sleeper car. And I realized that this particular sleeper car that I was imagining has an origin, which is in um, uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, 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 Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. Um, uh, you may remember, you may not remember Skimbleshanks, the railway cat. I feel like he's not one of the A-list practical cats. He's not, you know, just a leading light among cats. Um, but he was my favorite cat, um, and he's a railway cat. And there's a description in the, um, uh, in the poem, and I'm actually going to read a, a, a little bit of it. Oh, it's very pleasant when you found your little den with your name written up on the door. I think he's talking about finding your berth on the sleeper car. And the berth is very neat with a newly folded sheet, and there's not a speck of dust on the floor. There's every sort of light. You can make it dark or bright. There's a handle you turn to make a breeze. There's a funny little basin you're supposed to wash your face in and a crank to shut the window if you sneeze. Now, if this were a live event, I would ask everybody to put up their hands if they have actually spent a night on a sleeping car, an actual sleeping car on an actual train. And I can put up my hand and say that I have done this two times. The first time uh, I, was, I had flown to England uh, for Time magazine and I was interviewing John le Carré. I happen to love John le Carré, um, whose real name is David Cornwall. I kept calling him John. His real name is David. Um, and uh, you, fly, you fly into London and he lives in Cornwall. Um, uh, his name is Cornwall. And he lives in Cornwall. Uh, it was confusing. And uh, you um, t 
take the, uh, you, I, I realized you could take, I could take the night train, I could fly into London and then take the night train down to Penzance, which I also, I, add for, uh, I, would, I would ask for a show of hands of people who knew that Penzance was a real place and not just a Gilbert and Sullivan thing. Um, Penzance is real. Uh, and uh, John Le Carre, AKA David Cornwell, lives near there. So I took the night train from London to Penzance and what could be more, ro more romantic and skimble shanky uh, than doing that. I can tell you that I did not sleep a wink on the sleeping car from London to Penzance because it was so uncomfortable. Oh my God. You basically sleep on like a steel slab, um, you know, with this like microscopically thin sheet over you and under you, under the steel slab, about two feet away from your head are the wheels going click clack on the um, on the railway um, and it's just like a jackhammer and you're freezing and you're uncomfortable on this steel slab and the, you're free you're freezing because um, you have this 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 narrow sheet uh, that is all that is covering your shivering body um, and I remember turning up to uh, um, to John Le Carre's house um, and it, you know it was like one of those moments where you're meeting one of your favorite authors and I was just like I had to ask him if I could go lie down in another room <laughs> in another room in his spare bedroom for like an hour um and even then I was just um I don't remember anything that happened that day um except that his <laughs> his wife gave me some um uh clotted cream on a crumpet which is the most English and possibly the most Cornish thing that could ever that has ever happened to me. Um, and also we drank a lot of wine over lunch. Um, uh, anyway, uh, which is a long way of saying that uh, um, uh, I decided not to go with the reality in the book um, and the um, sleeping car that this young girl is in on the steam train is unbelievably, unbelievably comfortable. Um, so I had that I, 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 I kept thinking about this image um, of this girl on this train, um, and you know, as one does, you don't initially you don't want to touch it. You're like, oh, that image has like a lot of energy for me, and I'm just going to leave it alone for a while. And then, like about three weeks later, I felt comfortable enough to say, where is the train going? Um, how do we turn this static image into a story? And I was thinking about it, and then I saw the train going through this forest at night, and there's a light in the distance, and then it comes up to the station, and the station. Um, it's like an old fashioned train station in the middle of a forest, um, and waiting on the station, absolutely still under this light in the middle of the darkened forest are these animals and they're standing very still and they're very solemn. Um, and each one of them has a little train ticket that they're holding in their mouth or in their paws. Um, and I thought that image has some power to me as well. Um, and it's very Narnia-esque, but is it too Narnia? And then I thought, it can't be. There's no such, there's no such thing as Tunarnia. Um, I thought, you know, uh, I like it. I like it a lot. And then the, there was the third point, you know, in the se in the sequence, which was this girl is going to meet these animals and they're going to talk to each other. And what kind of conversation are they going to have? And at this point, I'm I'm trialing this out in my kids, um, and I'm sort of doing the animals and doing the the girl whose name turned out to be Kate talking to the animals. And it was different. It became very un-Narnia very fast. You think of Narnia and talking animals, and you think of the Pevensies in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and they're talking to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are take them in and give them tea, and they're so happy to see them because the kids from, um, from, from Earth are going to save the world. When Kate meets these animals, the conversation is it immediately it, it immediately went in a very different direction because things aren't the same as they were back in C.S. Lewis's time because our relationship with the natural world and with animals has changed completely. And if you put yourself in the place of the animals um, and they see the humans arrive, well, the humans, if you're an animal and the humans arrive, the humans have not come to save the day. If you are an animal, you are living in what amounts to a post-apocalyptic world. And the humans are not the hero of that story. So when the hum there's a lot of ambivalence when the, hu when the humans meet the animals. Um, and Kate, you know, has to realize that in this story, she is the hero, but she is also the villain at the same time. And that became really complicated. And I don't know, there was a lot of feeling and energy in it for me.
And that's when I knew that I was going to write it. Um, and so I did, and I, I did something that I'm very proud of, um, which is that I didn't tell anybody that I was writing it. And I wrote the whole first draft and second, third draft, the information leaked to my family, but I didn't tell my agent. And then one day I just attached the document to an email and I emailed it to my agent. And it's the only time I have ever surprised my agent in our 25 years of, work, of working together. I said, here's my middle grade novel. What do you think? I'm still really proud of that. It might be the thing that I'm most proud about. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about writing for children when you are somebody who writes for adults for a living um, because it was a really fascinating exercise and I feel like I learned a lot about myself and also children and also writing um, because I came to this project with a great deal of, I don't know if I would say hubris exactly because that would seem to sort of foretell my death in this story, but um, I was definitely overconfident. Um, to be a little bit inside baseball for a second, when you are a writer um, who writes for a living, um, one thing that you, you don't talk about pages. When you're talking about your work, you talk about how many words it is. Uh, because pages, um, as it turns out, are actually quite an elastic way of measuring a quantity of text. Because sometimes the font's very small and the kerning and the spacing between the lines. <clears throat> what you talk about is the number of words. And a magician's book is uh, uh, 145,000 words. All three of those books are almost exactly 145,000 words. And I went online and I found a PDF of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which seemed about the right length. Um, <clears throat> and I, st I stuck it into Word and I did a word count. Um, and it was about 35,000 uh, words. And I thought, holy moly, it's, um, I don't, can't do the math in my head of 35 divided by 145, but it's that amount of words um, less than a, <laughs> than a magician's novel. And I am so here for this. Um, but actually it turned out to be uh, about approximately as hard as writing uh, a magician's novel. Um, with children, uh, I, as, as I had, I could have, figured out if I had thought about it for 10 seconds, are an incredibly sophisticated audience. Um, you know, people talk about children having short attention spans when they read. When they read, they read with a kind of attention that adults, we are no longer able to summon that kind of intensity uh, with which a child loses him or herself um, in a book. Their attention is total. And they, um, if you, for a second, suffer a sense of self-doubt or indecision on the page or perhaps a too great affection for the awesomeness of your own prose, they know it and they're gone instantly. Um, if the narrative storyline goes slack for a moment, uh, if you make a continuity error, they, well, <laughs> they never forget. They are demons for continuity errors. Um, and uh, they, you know, they're not, uh, they're not lightweights. Children are, it turns out, are as smart as adults. They don't know everything that adults do, but they are as smart as them, and they have the same emotions that we do. They are angry in the same way, and they feel sadness and, you know, resentment and elation and joy. You have, you can't have child-sized emotions in your children, in your children's book. The, the books, um, have to be, um, they have to they have to have giant adult sized emotions in them life size emotions um and they also are very they're not afraid i um uh was i was very kind of lily livered about it initially writing for children um and everything was very very super g rated um uh and there was no violence or cruelty of any kind um and uh uh it was very boring um and i sort of had forgotten the simple fact that children have been to school and they have been to recess um, and they know what cruelty is. And if there is no cruelty in your book and nothing bad happens, they know that you are lying to them and they have no time for you. Um, uh, there's a, a, a character in the book who is a snake. Um, he is um, uh, uh, a mamba. And um, uh, Mambas, of course, are very venomous snakes. Um, and there came to be a moment where I was sort of, uh, the mamba was, people, they were, the animals were eating, and I thought, wow, I can't have the mamba eat because he's going to have to bite something and it's going to die, die horribly. And um, I can't show that to children. Um, but then I realized that um, uh, quite the opposite is true. In fact, 
it's very interesting what happens when a mamba bites something, which is that it starts to die in about six ways at the same time. And like, I mean, in a, a mamba venom, it's like, it's like the Sistine Chapel of venom. There's like neurotoxin in it, in it, uh, in it um, and it attacks your heart and your um, uh, uh, flesh starts to necrotize like almost immediately. Um, like it's just super bad news in about eight different ways. It's fascinating. Um, and I realized, and I was sort of rereading Roald Dahl and I realized, you know, Roald would have put uh, 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 all the venom in with all the symptoms. Um, you know, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have held back. Um, and uh, uh, I suddenly realized that if I held back, the book wouldn't feel real. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what the book is about. And I'm going to do a little short reading from it. Um, the Silver Arrow, uh, it's about a girl named Kate, as I mentioned. Um, Kate lives a sort of ordinary suburban existence. And Kate isn't an extraordinary person. She doesn't have any special skills. Um, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't look extraordinary. Um, and she is about to turn 11 and she's in that moment where, that children get to where they are very aware that there is this adult world waiting for them just over the horizon and they're just fanatically curious about it and they feel ready to be a part of it um, but they're not they're still treated like a child and they are only given childish things to play with um, and into this moment of sort of ennui that Kate is in comes her uncle Herbert who she's never met before because he's estranged from the family. Um, but he show, he's incredibly wealthy and he shows up with her 11th birthday present and it turns out to be a train, uh, an actual train, a full-size train. Uh, it's not like she asked for a train. I think she would have probably preferred Legos, but she doesn't get Legos. She gets a full-size working steam train. And pretty soon um, she and her brother Tom discover that it is a working steam train and then a set of mysterious tracks here running through her backyard and then we're sort of off to the races but I'm going to read you a really short bit from the first chapter um, which just to give a little bit of the voice of the book um, and this is the scene where she sees the train for the first time. Uh, what was really surprising though uh, was how big it was. I mean this thing was really big like too big to send through the mail. It arrived at their house on a specially reinforced double wide flatbed truck with 28 wheels, Tom counted. It was giant and black and incredibly complicated. In fact, it didn't look like a toy at all. It looked like an actual real life sized steam engine. That, Uncle Herbert explained, was because it was one. Uncle Herbert had come to deliver it personally in a banana yellow Tesla so insanely sleek and tricked out it looked like one of Tom's Hot Wheels. He was fat, with thinning brown hair and a round, mild-mannered face. He looked like a history teacher, or somebody who might take tickets at an amusement park. <clears throat> Kate was so surprised, she couldn't think of anything to say. That is a really big train, was all that she came up with. It would have to do. It's not a whole train, Uncle Herbert said modestly. It's just the engine uh, and a tender. That's the coal car right behind it. How much does it weigh? Tom asked. One hundred tons, Uncle Herbert said crisply. What exactly, Kate said, like it literally weighs exactly 100 tons? Well, no, Uncle Herbert said, it weighs 102 tons, 102.36. You're right to be suspicious of overly round numbers. I thought so, said Kate, who was. Here you can see a picture, and because uh, I'm a jerk, I remember giving the illustrator a lot of grief about the number of wheels on the flatbed truck. Um, because I'd said in the text that there were, what, 28 wheels on the flatbed truck, and I was like, I don't think there are 28 wheels on that truck. Um, and she had to point out to me that when, <laughs> you don't just count the wheels you can see, there's actually wheels on both sides of the truck. So actually there were 28 wheels. I didn't feel very good about that interaction. Um, Kate's father came out of the house too. In fact, most of the people on the street came out to look at the train. He put his hands on his hips. Herbert, he said, what the blazes is this? He didn't really say blazes, but you can't put the word that he did say in a book for children. It's a train, Uncle Herbert said, a steam train. I can see that, but what's it doing here on a truck so very close to my house? It's a present for Kate and Tom, I guess, if she wants to share. Well, it's a nice gesture, but couldn't you have to send her a toy? Well, it is a toy. Well, no, Herbert, that's not a toy. That's a real train. 
I suppose, Uncle Herbert said, but technically, if she's going to play with it, then sort of by definition, it's also a toy, if you think about it. Kate's father stopped and thought about it, which was a tactical error. What he probably should have done, Kate thought, was lose his temper and call the police. Her mother didn't have this problem. She came tearing out of the house, yelling, Herbert, you blazing blockhead, what the blaze do you think you're doing? Get this thing out of here. Kids, get off the train. She said that last part, because while all this was going on, Kate and Tom had gotten up onto the flatbed truck and were starting to climb up the sides of the train. They couldn't stop themselves. With all the pipes and knobs and spokes and whatnot, it was like rock climbing. They reluctantly got off it, but Kate still couldn't stop looking at it. It was giant and black and complicated with lots of fiddly little bits that obviously did interesting things and a cozy little cab that you sit in. It looked ominous and fascinating, like a sleeping dinosaur. The longer you looked at it, the more interesting it got. Stenciled along the side of the tender, in small white capital letters, were the words, The Silver Arrow. That was its name. They'd written it with a long, thin arrow sticking through the letters. It's not even silver, Kate's father said. It's black. And what would you do with a silver arrow anyway? Hunt werewolves, Kate said, obviously. And I'll stop there. But, as we will find out shortly, the train is magic and it can talk. And it, they go to pick up animals in it. And the animals can talk. Um, and a lot of, it's like by chapter six, a lot of things get revealed in this book that we didn't know about our world. Our world. I'll just say um, a couple things about steam trains. Um, uh, steam trains are, they're a real gift to storytellers. Um, I think I can see now why I got so stuck on that idea of writing about a steam train. Um, steam trains are, it, it seems silly to say that they're incredibly complicated, but um, I've always noticed that, f for me, I tend to think of people who lived in the past um, as being not as smart as people who live right now because they didn't, they don't have all the cool stuff that we have, like iPhones. Um, but um, they, of course, were every bit as smart as you are. And steam trains are unbelievably complicated. If you start getting into how they work, they're like computers. They're like giant iron computers that are powered by steam, and you ride inside of them. And if you make a mistake with them, then they explode. And I liked the idea of Kate having to kind of master this technology. Part of growing up now, it seems like, is mastering a lot of different technologies. And I liked sort of the drama of Kate mastering this enormous hurtling steam train. Um, and of course, they are, um, uh, uh, they're sort of wonderful in that you put a character in a train, and on the one hand, they are going through the world and they're kind of exploring it, and they're seeing all these incredible sights, and they can stop and get out and have adventures. But even when they're on the train, the, 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 the train is itself like kind of a world unto itself, and they can explore inside the train as well. So you have this kind of world of wonders around the train, and then you have a world of other wonders inside the train. Um, and if, if things ever get boring, you can switch from one to the other. Um, it's quite a pleasure to write about characters on a train. Um, I can see why Agatha Christie did it. Um, I'll just say two final things to close. Um, one uh, is that while I try to be very real and represent the darkness and unpleasantness of the world that we live in, um, I cheated on two counts. Um, and one of them is the fact that um, uh, in the book, uh, the silver arrow goes on a giant loop like a roller coaster and it turns upside down. As it turns out, you can't do that with a steam train. Um, uh, apparently, because of the way the boiler works, um, uh, if you turn a steam train upside down, something gets exposed that shouldn't get exposed and the whole train will explode. So never do that with your steam train. Um, and the other thing I'll say is, there's a lot of animal characters in the book. There's the mamba, who I mentioned. There's a heron, um, who's a major character. There's a porcupine. There's a polar bear. Um, and there's a pangolin. Uh, pangolin oddly, pangolins, oddly enough, and I feel strangely prescient, um, uh, pangolins have been in the news lately. Um, but I was into pangolins before they were cool. And I'll tell you something about pangolins. Um, uh, pangolins are unbelievably cute, and they are covered in scales, which is crazy because they're mammals, and there's no other mammals in the world that are covered with scales. Um, pangolins also have unbelievably long tongues. Their tongue, uh, a pangolin's tongue, is about as long as the whole rest of its body, um, which I think, I think is really cool. But then about halfway through when I was writing the book, I started to think, pangolins have little tiny heads. It's part of why they're so cute. Um, but they have these incredibly long tongues. How does the tongue fit inside the head of the pangolin? 
And I did a little research on this, and it turns out it's because another thing that makes uh, pangolins unusual among animals is that um, when they are done with their tongues and they're not sticking them out and licking up ants with them, their tongue um, doesn't go into their mouth. It goes all the way down inside their chest. And that's where their tongue is sitting, and it's all coiled up in there like a snake, and then it comes out again when they stick out their tongue. I found this image so dark and disturbing that I was unable to include <laughs> include it in the silver arrow. I just didn't feel like the world was ready to know that pangolins keep their tongues inside their chests. Um, but the rest of it uh, I put in. Um, and, you know, as I uh, wrote it and as I worked through the story with my kids, um, I became more and more aware that the generation of children that is growing up now, they are facing a challenge that is utterly unlike anything that any generation before them have ever faced. And I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that about this generation. I'm sure there are other generations that have faced new things, but it's truly unbelievable the challenge that children now have inherited from us. They have inherited this disaster that is not of their own making, and they are going to have to confront it, and they're going to have to be smart and, you know, more grown up than anybody should ever have to be, and they'll have to make sacrifices and they're going to have to think about their places in the world in this way that nobody, no humans ever really have before. And I feel like I don't know how to help them with that, um, except to write a story about it. And that's what I did. Thank you all very much. Um, I think that's the end of the talk, the, the me talking part of the evening. Um, but Jessica, maybe we could do some Q&A, some questions and answers. Yes, are you ready for some questions? We have some good ones from our audience today. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so tired of listening to myself talk, and I'm about to talk again. But for just a brief moment, Jessica can talk. Yeah, for sure. And if you still have questions, you can post them in the chat if you want or in the Q&A. Um, so the first one I have is from Evelyn. She says, hi, Lev. And she says, Bef Evelyn. you said before that your kids have been a source of inspiration behind the book, but is there any specific influence in the character or personality of Kate and Tom? Um, well, what, <laughs> when you ask me to be specific, that means that I have to think. Um, so I'm just going to take a moment and think. Um, I think that, well, so, you know, something I already mentioned. Um, when I was when I was a kid, I was a very I was very, I was always I may still be young for my age. Um, I was never a child who wanted to grow up, um, and it's something I notice about um, Hallie, uh, who is my middle chi child, is that she is. Um, she actually just turned 10, but she's very aware of the difference between real things and play things, and she's very interested in real things. And she wants, she wants to do things that are real and things that matter. Um, I think she's a little bit tired of, of, of playing and pretending. Um, and, and that was something, uh, I wonder if there's anything really specific um, that I can point to. Um, there was a passage that my children came up with, uh, and I include my oldest child, um, who is now 16, um, and they were very proud of this passage where the train is going along and it stops and it gets to a train station um, and there's no people on the, on the train station and there's actually not any animals on the train station. It's all full of furniture. And every piece of furniture has a ticket. <laughs> and Kate just stands there and all the furniture shuffles onto the train um, and finds itself a place to see. And there's, you know, umbrella stands and there's lamps. My children love that part so much. <laughs> And in the end, I didn't feel that we could keep it. It seemed too magic, and also it had nothing to do, <laughs> to, to do with the story. Um, and in the end, I cut it. That was a very specific thing that they came up with. Um, and I should say something about Tom as well, um, because Tom is uh, Kate's younger brother, um, and uh, uh, he's very much associated with my, with my mind, in my mind with my youngest child, Vance, who's seven. Um, and... Uh, I spent a lot of time on, uh, on, on Tom, and he has a lot of Vaz in him, and it just, it, 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 it brought home very much the weirdness of being a little boy, um, uh, who he processes things, his emotions, almost completely through his body. Um, he has words, but they don't connect with his feelings as much, um, and this is probably has to do with the horrible ways that we socialize boys. Um, but so, uh, uh, you know, if, if he feels like upset about something, he has to run around and wave his arms and break things that are in the house. Um, and that's how he works through um, his feelings. And then sometimes his feelings just get even bigger than that, and then he has to cry. 
Uh, and that's something that happens to Tom. And it's something that uh, really does come directly from my kids. And I feel like I should say something about my oldest child, who is 16. Um, and they are the one who really urged me to write this down and make it into a book. Tragically, it took me so long to finish writing the book that they are now 16 and too cool to read it. Um, but I still want to credit them with uh, uh, how much they helped me with the book. And in fact, they are in the book, just not in the obvious place. Uh, the train uh, talks and their personality, which is cold and sarcastic and yet also somehow deeply vulnerable, um, is uh, in this way that they can't quite completely cop to. Um, it, it, it's very based on um, my oldest child's personality and their voice. And they know this. I'm not telling tales out of school. I think that they feel okay about it. This question is maybe related to that one. Brenda is asking, are your stories to your kids fluid or do they stick to the same plot? So is this story the one you told your kids or a variant? Um, it's, it's definitely a variant. Um, I mean, when I tell stories, I would love to say that uh, my stories for my children um, are, uh, uh, are rich and braided and, and, and novelistic. Um, you know, they, they really aren't. Um, um, uh, I have, um, <laughs> most of my stories are, they, they sort of, they live and die very much in the moment. Um, and they fall into two major categories. Um, uh, one are stories about Lex Luthor, who has become a very, I would actually say that he's become quite a rich character in our sort of private family lore. And the others, um, have to do with, um, the Jedi Academy, which is where you train to be a Jedi. Um, and generally speaking, if I'm telling a story, it's Lex Luthor or it's a Jedi Academy. Um, uh, but they, you know, they, they, um, they're little sort of mayfly stories and they disappear. Um, very rarely do they stick. Um, they do sometimes stick and this is one that stick, that stuck. But I spent a lot of time, um, filling it out. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of characters in the, in, in the Silver Arrow. You can't put that many story, characters, I feel like, in, in a, a story for children because it has to tick along and you're on your way to school. You've actually got about 11 minutes to tell the story in. Um, uh, so it's very much elaborated from, uh, from the original oral, oral version. Great. Um, so this question is from Dustin, who asks, um, who notes, the magicians is definitively adult in its subject matter and its language, etc. Did you find you had to consciously keep your writing age appropriate as you wrote, or was it easy to shift gears due to having experience crafting stories for your own kids? Um, first, I want to say hi to Dustin. And then I want to say, um, um, uh, I want to answer that question in a clear and strong way. And by and I will do so by saying it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, the real risk that I, uh, and I think I, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, the real risk that I ran was, um, trying, was thinking of it as telling a children's story. Um, and as soon as I did that, all the life kind of went out of it and it became very flat um, and uninteresting and the language became uninteresting. And I had to actually discipline myself to say, um, you know what, I'm just going to write the story the way I would tell it to another adult. Um, and kid things will happen in it, but I'm going to describe them the way that I would um, tell them to another, another adult. And I'll make jokes that I'll think that, that I think another adult would find funny. Um, and I'll pursue digressions that I feel like would interest adults. Um, and only by doing that, um, and really in a sort of hard edged way, not talking down, um, to, uh, to the audience, did I end up turning it into, uh, something that felt interesting and kind of had the tone that I wanted. Um, I think my one concession is that all the, um, swears were replaced by the word blaze. Um, <laughs> Instead of, uh, instead of, instead of swearing, the characters all say blaze. Um, and there used to be actually a lot more blazing in the book. Um, I, during the course of editing, many of the blazes came out, but there's still a few there. Blaze is a very useful word. That's... It is. It is. I feel like it should make a comeback. Yeah. So I have a question here um, from a kid, and I know that because it's a person that I know. Her name is Marion, and she says, I've read the book. And she wants to know, how does Uncle Herbert know that you should put a station under the water? That's a very good question, Marianne. Um, <laughs> um, 
Uncle Herbert, I haven't talked about Uncle Herbert much. Um, Uncle Herbert is Kate's uncle, um, and uh, he is estranged from the family. I guess I did say that. Um, and he's very wealthy, and also he can do magic. Um, and uh, uh, it was Uncle Herbert is a little is is a slightly a private joke to myself because Uncle Herbert is actually a wizard, um, and for some reason I thought it was really funny to have a wizard in the story, but then have, not, have him not be the hero. He's just like kind of around the edges and he does wizardy stuff, you know, the way that a janitor does janitorial things. Um, and I won't say that I did a lot of rigorous world building around, <laughs> around Herbert. He definitely has magic powers um, and where they end um, uh, and where they start and his mysterious sources of information remain pretty mysterious. Um, uh, all I will say is that I spent much of today um, uh, writing the outline for the sequel to The Silver Arrow, um, and it will answer all of your questions, Marianne. I promise. But not yet. That's fair. No spoilers. Something to look forward to. That's great. Um, okay, here's a question from Katie, who asks, who also says, hi, Lev, um, and says, what have you learned about the ways that magic and technology connect or don't connect in the fantasies that you write? That's another really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> Boy, do I have a lot to say about that. Um, um, uh, ma cause magic and technology, <clears throat> um, I, there are a lot of, um, hybrid fantasies that incorporate high magic and high technology. And, um, for some reason I've never found myself really able to get interested in them. And something I did in the magicians, um, was that I always made them sort of mutually exclusive. Um, and uh, um, technology misbehaves in the presence of, um, of magic. And so Breakables, the school for magic is largely low technology, although there is an old early gen Xbox in a closet somewhere that, that they occasionally play, but it always hangs when anybody casts a spell anywhere near it. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, even in the Silver Arrow, which is actually a lot about technology, I, uh, I really wanted um, um, this process of mastering a large piece of technology to be part of the story. Um, I noticed that I kept to steam, um, I, 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 I kept to steam, and it's a very analog kind of um, technology. And I think it's partly because magic, for me at least, you know, it's very, it's a very, and fantasy in general, it is an unabashedly nostalgic um, genre. And magic, one of the things that magic does in fantasy novels, it tends to actually do a lot of the same things that technology does. Um, you know, it, it allows you to, um, to blast people and to speak to people who are far away um, and see what's going on there. Um, and I often find it as a way, uh, uh, fantasy novels I think are very much about technology in the sense that they, they, they um, they're about kind of what happens if you if you took technology out of the world. They're about kind of the negative space that technology would leave if you removed it um, from the world. Uh, and as a result, they have become very much about the kind of the the uh, what we give up by letting technology as deep into our lives um, as we do. Um, it reminds us that you know uh, uh, what it costs us um, to become a technological species. Um, and I think that's the case in the Silver Arrow uh, as well. There's technology in it, um, but it's uh, very analog technology. Also, it can talk to you, so there's some magic in there somewhere. I think that the, the uh, Silver Arrow um, has an electric light bulb in it because it has a headlight. Um, uh, although, interestingly, um, and I discovered this about steam engines, and I shouldn't talk about steam engines because one thing I've discovered is that when you're on the internet, there is always somebody there who knows 10 times as much about steam engines as you. Um, and there's no, it's turtles, it's like steam engines all the way down. There's, oh, there's, there's an endless sequence of people who know more about steam engines. Um, but I will say this, that um, uh, steam engines uh, generally had a little generator on board um, uh, that would be run by steam power. So they were kind of in this cool way, turning the steam into light um, by running this electric light off it. Um, so there is a little bit of electric technology in there, but very little. Um, um, so in, in conclusions, Argentina is a land of contrasts. And that was a long uh, answer to that question. Very good, book report. Um, so this question is from Jennifer who notes that she is tuning in from Melbourne, Australia. Um, oh, wow. I was going to say tonight, but I actually don't know if it's tonight in Melbourne right now. Um, she says, well done on another great read. 
Some would say that intentionally ensuring a diversity of characters with a range of racial, sexual, and other backgrounds in children's or young adult fiction is increasingly important in today's world. What are your thoughts on this? Should authors be mindful of ensuring their fictional characters are not all white, able-bodied, and middle class? Yes, I, I think that they should. Um, I actually think that's really important. Um, and it's something that, um, it's something that I didn't do in The Magicians really at all. And it's, it's something that dates the book and, and limits the book. And it's something that they, one of the things they did in the TV show that was, that went far beyond the books. Um, and uh, it's something I'm really grateful for. Um, and it, it's, uh, it, there's only three human characters in, um, uh, uh, in the Silver Arrow. Um, and they're, both white. They're all three. All three of them are white. Two of them are, are sort of lower middle class, um, but again, there isn't a ton of diversity, and I'm not going to fudge it by saying that there's snakes and pangolins in it. Um, uh, it's something that I haven't confronted in my fiction, um, and that is, you know, that I, I, I'm going to backtrack very slightly and say, um, at the time it was considered quite radical to have gay people in um, fantasy. And it's something that I did in The Magicians. And it's along these lines, it's one of the few things that I'm proud of. Um, and I feel like there were people, there were books that followed after this that, you know, um, uh, that did that. Um, but uh, in other ways, um, my fiction has been very limited and it's something I haven't conf uh, uh, really confronted and engaged with. Um, I don't know. It's, it's something that for me is a, a work in progress. Thanks for answering. Um, here's a question from Elliot, um, who says, yeah, Lev, when writing The Magicians, you'd said Quentin was where you were at a certain point, And with this one, your kids inspired it. When finding your voices for the characters, is it always personal? Oh, it's always personal. And any author who tells you otherwise um, is, is, I don't know, selling something. Um, uh, yeah, it's always personal. Um, and, you know, that said, uh, you're always trying to get outside yourself um, and find the other people in you when you're writing. Um, this is a, a good question since it kind of, um, it, it, it relates to the one that came just before it. Um, it. It's always personal and you always want to try to see how far you can get outside yourself. Um, and in The Silver Arrow, a lot of, of it was, um, uh, was trying to think um, like an animal and uh, even like a plant. Um, uh, spoiler alert, the characters turn into trees at one point <clears throat> for an entire year. Um, you know, this book was very much about, for me, grappling with climate change and, and what's happening with people in the natural world. Um, and, uh, you know, in that sense, you see how far you can get um, outside yourself um, and see how far you can push into your own blind spots. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the, the exercise of fiction and, the, and, and what's wonderful about it. Um, uh, and frustrating as well, because you never get all the way into your blind spots. There's always an increment left. Thanks again. Um, this one's a bit on a lighter note. I think it's related to your comments about pangolins um, because Samuel wants to know, Aren't armadillos also mammals with scales? <laughs> it's been wonderful having you here. Um, uh, I'm sorry that we're out of time. <laughs> um, I don't know. Somebody with a phone ought to check this right now um, because I've so often seen the factoid that uh, penguins are the only mammals with scales. Um, I'll be so disappointed if that's true of armadillos as well. But that's what paper deck editions are for because you can always fix it. <laughs> it's fun, fun to think about mammals with scales. We hope everyone comes back with answers. Um, another animal related question. Um, Evelyn is back again and, and says that you've mentioned many talking animals, pangolin, mamba, porcupine, but were there any animals you wanted to include but ultimately decided against? So many. The, 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 cutting, <laughs> the cutting room floor is really littered with talking animals um, who, um, who did not manage to make it, <laughs> to make it into um, uh, into this book, um, I will give you, for example, insects, 
I'm led to believe by many scientists that are, there are animals in this world called insects, many of them, and none of them are in the, uh, the, the none of them take the train. Maybe it's because they just fly with their tiny wings. Um, but they never, uh, there, there aren't any talking insects. Maybe I was afraid of insects and how alien and weird they are. Um, I've really resolved, and again, I'm, in this case, I'm talking out of school, there's going to be a hive of bees in the next book. And I'm actually not sure whether the bees speak with one voice or whether each bee has its own individual voice. I would appreciate feedback from anybody who knows more about bees than I do. You may be interested to know that bees are the only mammals that have scales. <laughs> I'm the source of a lot of, <laughs> a lot of useful information tonight. Um, and there's going to be a wolverine. I feel like wolverines have been really overwhelmed by wolverine, the X-Man. And so I really feel as though wolverines need to speak for themselves a little bit more. And um, we're going to have one in the next book. Wonderful. If you have thoughts on bees, wolverines, or scaled mammals, please feel free to put them in the chat. We have just a couple more minutes for questions um, before we have to wrap up. Um, here's one. Maybe this is an opportunity for promotion. But um, Sam asks, as the story began as an oral storytelling adventure, have you listened to any of the audiobook? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, talking about my blind spots, um, I've never been able to listen to an audiobook of my own work. It is a feeling akin to hearing the sound of one's own voice, which I personally find, find very unpleasant. Um, and people have said to me that the audiobooks of The Magicians are good, which makes me really happy. And actually, I'm really excited about the audiobook of The, um, uh, of the Silver Arrow because um, Little Brown, uh, they don't have to do this, but they were really, they sent me a lot of different um, samples of actors reading and, and voice, oh, voice, voice reading artists, what do you call somebody who reads a book? Um, uh, you know, book reading artists reading the book aloud and they let me choose. And I don't know if it was, if, uh, if, if they went with the same person that I picked, if that's a coincidence or if they actually were respecting my wishes, but they got this really incredibly voiced person. Um, I realized that I couldn't have Stephen Fry voice it and I really wanted him to, but you can't have Stephen Fry. Um, he's one of the things you can't have in this life. Um, but this guy was like, he sounded so great. And my only, my only um, uh, 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 nitpick was that I, he is, I don't, I didn't think that his American accent was perfect. So I said, look, just read it all in an English accent and we'll all, we'll just pretend that there everybody's English because it would, wouldn't it be great in some ways if everybody was English? Probably not, but I wanted that to be the case. Um, and so I think everybody in the audiobook is English um, uh, and has an English accent. And that's just how things, worked out. The English edition, by the way, is really great. And, um, uh, and, and uh, they, uh, there's a lot of candy in this book. It's a real sort of candy orgy kind of scene. And they replace a lot of the American candies with um, English candies, which makes it sort of a delight all over again to read that scene for me anyway. It does sound like a treat. Wow. Um, okay, so this will be our last question. It's kind of a biggish one. So feel free to punt if you if you don't feel up to it. But it says I I just joined and may have missed this, so apologies if so. This is from Nan, but she says, can Lev talk about the influence of authors like C.S. Lewis and Diana Wynne-Jones? Um, uh, you know, I can and I can't. Um, it's been, always been one of the weird, my weird sort of ticks that um, I'm very, I think a lot about the writers who influence me. And I know writers who don't, who, who don't tend to read fiction while they're writing fiction because um, they uh, feel as though it, it, it inhibits their ability to, um, uh, focus their own voice. I, vampirically, love to read other authors who are better writers than me um, and, um, ha and, 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 I, and allow them to influence my, my own voice as a writer. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, the Roald Dahl was a very, very um, big one for me. Um, uh, I think he's the, probably the writer that I came back to the most often. Um, but Enid Blyton is a big one for me. Um, uh, uh, Twins at Sinclair, that series, and Mallory Towers, um, Naughtiest Girl in School, um, are such, such great books. Um, and, but there's a lot, C.S. Lewis is, is definitely in the mix. One thing that happens if you go back to C.S. Lewis and read him as an adult is you realize what a ridiculously good prose artist he was. Um, he's one of these guys who they haven't gone flat when you go back to them. Uh, their uh, his his work is so good. Um, I guess the only uh, there's a, there's a long list. I think the only the only other one that I would throw out there is not a writer at all, but um, Miyazaki. 
there is a lot of Miyazaki in my work in general, um, and in this book in particular. I often feel as though um, when I am writing, all that I am doing is chasing that feeling that you have when you're watching Spirited Away and she gets on the train and it goes over the water. I often feel like all I'm, all I'm trying to do is get to that feeling, which is just such an intense, important feeling. Um, I will close with an embarrassing anecdote about myself, which is that uh, um, um, in addition to falling asleep in the presence of John le Carré, um, I also once interviewed um, Miyazaki. Um, he doesn't give a ton of interviews, but I think it was when Ponyo was coming out and they were giving it a big uh, release in America. And he came to Comic-Con in San Diego and I was there and I interviewed him. Um, and I burst into tears. I don't think I've ever cried in front of, I, I've interviewed many people in my life and I never cried in front of any of them, but I um, cried in front of Miyazaki because I was so moved to be in his presence. Every, no one knew where to look, but it just was one of those moments. I have the feeling that it's happened to him before. I don't think that was his first time at that particular rodeo and we all got through it. Um, but it was a very moving experience to meet him. Um, and he's a very living presence in everything I write. Um, but I think most of all in um, Silver Arrow. Well, it's such a wonderful book. Everyone is in for a treat as soon as you get your hands on it. I've posted the link in the chat once again. And again, we do have signed copies, which is very exciting. So let us know if you'd like mm -hmm. one of those. Thanks so much for spending the evening with us and thanks so much, Lev, for this book. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, it's been, thank you for sharing this day with me, which is a special day and um, this kind of made it more special. Have a great night. Take care. <laughs>